practical value. From a practical point of view, the teachings touch on impermanence more than other characteristics, because impermanence is more apparent. The state of pressure, stress and friction, dukkata, is moderately difficult to observe, and is therefore referred to less. <coughs> the characteristic of non-self is the most subtle and difficult to see and is referred to the least. The more obvious sign of impermanence is used as a foundation to explain the characteristics of dukkha and non-self. <coughs> the following two verses of the Buddha which highlight impermanence show the value of the three characteristics for Dhamma practice. Indeed all conditioned things are impermanent prone to arise and pass away. Having arisen, they cease. Their coming to rest is true, truest bliss. Monks, all conditioned things are of a nature to decay. Strive to attain the goal by diligence. Note that the first verse describes the state in which conditioned things, sankara, are stilled. That is, it refers to Nibbana. It describes how Nibbana is not subject to change. It is not subject to rising and falling, to dissolution and disintegration. It is a state of true happiness. The verse Anicca Vata Sankara is very frequently chanted and cited to the extent that it has become an important part of the Veda tradition. In relation to ordinary people, this verse is linked to practical application. It is defined in such a way that people can benefit from contemplating the stilling condition of conditioned things evident in their own lives. The first verse thus advocates a proper relationship to the world and to life in general. The value of thoroughly comprehending <coughs> that all things are compounded, unstable and subject to change, they cannot be commanded at will. They accord with causes and they exist just so. With this knowledge a person maintains an appropriate attitude towards life and clinging ceases. Despite alteration, decay and disappearance of cherished objects, the mind is not overwhelmed and disturbed. It remains clear, radiant and joyful on account of its innate wisdom, which leads to true peace. This verse emphasizes liberation of the heart Transcend transcendence, which is the benefit of spiritual practice. <coughs> the second verse calls atten attention to virtuous conduct, which is condu conducive to <coughs> the realization of the supreme state. This realization stems from the knowledge that all things are ever Epe, mero, and subject to pressure. Fluxes, perpetual, relentless, and inexorable. Human life especially is fleeting, uncertain, and unreliable. Knowing this, one makes effort in that which should be done, and refrains from that which should be avoided. One does not procrastinate or waste opportunities. One strives to rectify harmful situations, takes heed to protect oneself from further damage, and cultivates virtue by reflecting with wisdom, which accords with conditions. As a result, one fulfills one's responsibilities and attains one's goals. This verse emphasizes diligence and careful attention, which are mundane and practical qualities. 
these qualities are the benefits of proper conduct. Once you'd apply this second engaged course of action to all levels of human affairs, from personal to social issues, from secular to spiritual matters, and from earning a living to seeking the enlightened truth of the Buddha. The following teachings of the Buddha highlight this quality. Monks, considering personal well-being, you should accomplish it with care. Considering others' well-being, you should accomplish it with care. Considering the well-being of both, you should accomplish it with care. There is one quality, great king, which secures dual welfare, both present, visible welfare, and future, subtle welfare. This quality is heedfulness, a pamada. A wise person who is heedful secures dual welfare, both present and future. The steadfast one, by securing these two benefits, is called a sage. Monks, <coughs> a person of good moral conduct, perfect in moral conduct, through careful attention to his affairs, gains much wealth. By earnest endeavour, Appa Mada, monks, I attained enlightenment. And you too, monks, if you put forth undeterred effort, in no long time you shall realise the goal of the holy life, by way of superior wisdom in this very life. <coughs> The two benefits derived from spiritual practice and from proper conduct are mutually supportive by their consummation through right training, a person obtains supreme well-being. Spiritual practice leading to liberation Spiritual benefit and the practice for its fulfilment relates directly to the highest goal of Buddha Dharma. It is of utmost importance concerning the entire spectrum of Buddhist teachings, because many details of its development require special understanding. The text refers to it frequently and at length. Some texts, for example the Visuddhimagga, outline this development as an ordered system. Rather than describe specifics here, I will only offer a broad summary. <coughs> Those people who discern the three characteristics grow in wisdom and acquire a clearer understanding of life. In addition, they normally undergo two important transformative mental images. Um, transformative mental stages. <coughs> Stage 1 Once a person understands conditionality more clearly and has gained an intermediate insight into impermanence, dukkha and non-self, a uh, reaction occurs. A feeling arises unlike any feeling previously experienced. Whereas formerly the person was captivated and delighted by sense objects, having now discerned the three characteristics, sentiment changes into discontentment and aversion, <coughs> and sometimes into disgust. At this stage, emotions are predominant over wisdom. Despite the deficiency of wisdom, and the remainder of mental bias, this stage is nonetheless important and occasionally even crucial for escaping from the power of attachment and for attaining the perfection in stage 2. Conversely, by stopping at this point, a person's prejudice can be harmful. Stage 2 at this stage a person has cultivated a thorough understanding of reality, 
Wisdom has entered the stage of completion. All feelings of repulsion disappear, replaced by a feeling of equanimity. There exists neither infatuation nor disgust, neither attachment nor aversion. There remains only a lucid understanding of things as they truly are, along with a feeling of spaciousness. A person is able to act appropriately and judiciously. This level of mental development, included in the practice of insight meditation, Vipassana, is called equanimous knowledge of formations, Sankara, Rupeka, Jnana. <coughs> it is a necessary stage of direct realization of truth and of the complete freedom of the heart. There are two important fruits of liberation, especially when liberation is complete in stage two. Freedom from suffering, liberated individuals are relieved of all harm resulting from clinging. Their happiness exists independent of alluring material objects. The mind is unrestricted, joyous, fearless and sorrowless. It is not stricken by the vacillations of worldly conditions, Lokadama. <coughs> this feature affects ethics as well as since these people do not create problems by venting unhappiness on others, which is a significant cause for social conflict, they develop spiritual qualities notably loving kindness and compassion, which act for the welfare of all. Absence of defilement. <coughs> Liberated persons are free from the power of mental defilement, example, greed, anger, covetousness, prejudice, confusion, jealousy and conceit. Their minds are clear, unfettered, calm and pure. This feature has direct influence on behaviour, both individual and social. Personally, they apply wisdom in an unadulterated way. They are not biased by aversion or selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. Externally, they do not commit offences prompted by defilement. They perform wholesome actions righteously and without hesitation, since no defilements like laziness or self-centeredness impede and disturb. <coughs> Nevertheless, when still not fully developed and existing in isolation, i.e. when not supported by the practice of heedfulness, spiritual practice can still be harmful, since the good can be a cause for unskillfulness. Having attained some spiritual advances and found peace and happiness, people are likely to revel in this happiness. They are likely to rest on their laurels, abandon effort or neglect unfinished responsibilities. In short, they fall into heedlessness as confirmed by the Buddha. And how Nandiya is a noble disciple, one who dwells negligently. Here Nandiya, a noble disciple, possesses firm confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. He possesses the virtues dear to the noble ones, content with this firm confidence. With these virtues he does not make further effort. In this way, Nandiya, a noble disciple, dwells neg negligently. <coughs> the way to avoid such harm is to integrate the second practice. The practice of heedfulness. Out of habit, people generally follow two pathways while conducting their affairs. When oppressed by suffering or in crisis, people hasten to amend the situation. 
Sometimes they are able to solve the problem, while at other times they cannot and must face loss or ruin. Even if they succeed, they experience much distress and struggle <coughs> to find a lasting solution. They may even find defeat amidst their success, win the battle but lose the war. While at ease in everyday life, having attended to immediate concerns, people then become complacent, allowing the days to pass by searching for pleasure or indulging in gratification. They do not occupy themselves with avoiding future harm. Unless cornered, they postpone their responsibilities. Assaulted by affliction or danger, they hasten to find relief. Having escaped, they are content to partake in their delights. This cycle continues until one day they are powerless to alter the course of events or are destroyed in their attempt to escape. The conduct described above is referred to as Pam Ada, which can be variously translated as negligence, heedlessness, laxness, disregard, lack of effort, and lethargy. It tends to go hand in hand with laziness. The opposite quality is referred to uh, as apamada, diligence, heedfulness, which is roused and guided by mindfulness. Diligent persons are continually aware of what must be avoided and what must be pursued, and commit themselves to these tasks. They recognize the importance of time, of work, and of the slightest responsibility. They are not intoxicated or overly enthralled by life. They make every effort to avoid transgression and miss no opportunity to grow in virtue. They hasten towards their goal or towards the good without interruption and take great care in their preparations. There are three important attributes of heedfulness, apamada. One, one recognizes the importance of every moment. One does not allow opportunities to pass by in vain. One uses time in the most valuable and beneficial way. Two, one is not intoxicated, indulgent, reckless and f or forgetful. One is constantly vigilant in order to avoid making careless mistakes or falling into corrupt or evil ways. 3. One hastens to cultivate virtue and create well-being. One endeavours in one's duties and responsibilities and one acts thoroughly. One strives to develop the mind and foster wisdom. This factor is referred to as heedfulness in regard to all virtuous qualities. An undertaking of the three characteristics directly promotes diligence because when one knows that all things are impermanent, unstable and fleeting, non-compliant and subject to cause, then only one way of practice remains, which is to act in conformity with causes and conditions. This means that one makes effort to protect oneself from unwholesome influences, to repair damage, to preserve beneficial qualities, and to act meritoriously for further progress. This practice involves investigating causality and acting accordingly. For example, aware that all things are subject to change, one strives to act in such a way that desired salutary conditions increase and exist as long as possible, and that they give the maximum benefit to others. Upon closer examination, one sees that the real cause for or forced behind this diligence is suffering. 
People's relationship to suffering, however, affects their reaction to it, resulting in either heedlessness or care. And even careful responses vary in quality. An analysis of this dynamic will show the value of Appamada. There are three ways to respond to suffering. One, conduct based on the strain of suffering. Some people indulge in comfort and pleasure, neglect their responsibilities, do not consider potential danger, but rather wait until danger confronts them. Faced with trouble and necessity, they hasten to remedy the situation, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. 2. Conduct based on fear of suffering. Some people fear suffering and difficulty and so strive to prevent hardship, although their attempts to establish more security are usually successful, their minds are burdened by anxiety. Because fearing suffering, they suffer from fear, and the act prompted by this secondary source of distress. 3. Conduct based on knowledge of suffering. Some people reflect with wisdom on how to manage with potential suffering. They are not intimidated by fear since they understand the nature of the three characteristics. They recognize potential danger, they investigate the dynamics of change, relying on the awareness of impermanence and the liberty and flexibility afforded by the characteristic of non-self. <clears throat> to choose the best way forward. In addition, they use past experience as a lesson to prevent suffering and to steer towards the greatest possible good. They are relieved of as much suffering as in their power, to the point of being free from all mental suffering and anxiety. The first type of behaviour is heed, heedlessness. The first type of behaviour is heedless. Types 2 and 3 are performed with care, but type 2 is a caution fed by defilement and thus bound up with suffering. Type 3, on the other hand, springs from wisdom and is therefore trouble free. No mental suffering arises. This is full and proper heedfulness, which only an arahant practices perfectly. The quality of vigilance for an awakened person depends on their ability to, uh, to apply wisdom, in line with type 3, and on the reduction of stress caused by fear and anxiety of type 2. As described above, ordinary people are not the only ones susceptible to heedlessness. Persons in the initial stages of enlightenment can be careless as well. The reason for this carelessness is contentment, satisfaction and complacency concerning exceptional qualities that they have attained. They delight in happiness and ease and abandon their spiritual work. Another reason is that they have perceived the three characteristics. They have a profound understanding of change and they are reconciled to conditionality. And they are not troubled by decay and separation. Because of this ease and reconciliation, they stop. They show no further interest and make no effort to deal with unresolved issues. They neglect the necessary tasks for prevention or improvement, allowing problems to simply remain or even worsen. In this case, the attainment of spiritual benefit or of initial liberation is the grounds for carelessness. These individuals act incorrectly. Their practice is one-sided and incomplete. Lacking the effort required to achieve the full value of heedfulness. <coughs> 
To rectify the situation, they must be aware of both the benefits, the spiritual and the practical, and bring them to completion. Thorough knowledge of things based on an understanding of the three characteristics loosens or releases clinging to things. This non-clinging is at the heart of liberation and freedom from suffering, leading to the ultimate goal of Buddhism. One cause for heedless behavior is attaching to non-attachment. In proper practice, letting go occurs by itself. It is a consequence of clearly seeing things according to the truth of the three characteristics. Some people, however, do not yet have this lucid discernment. They have simply heard about this truth and rationalize about it forming a half-baked understanding. Furthermore, they hold on to the idea that by grasping nothing whatsoever, they will be released from suffering. Thinking in this way, they try to prove themselves and others that they do not attach to anything or are free of defilement to the extent of taking nothing seriously. The result is functional imbalance, inattentiveness and negligence. This is attachment to non-attachment. It is a counterfeit non-attachment. A comparison of activities prompted by different motivations helps to highlight the activity prompted, prompted by heedfulness. Compare the four kinds of activity and inactivity. One. Some people do not act if they receive no personal advantage or if they will lose an advantage. They act to gain or to protect an advantage. Two. Some people do not act because they attach to non-attachment. They abstain from acting to show that they are free from free of defilement. Three. Some people do not act as a result of carelessness delighting in contentment and ease, unafflicted by suffering or resigned to conditionality, they are complacent. For some people act or refrain from acting dependent on wise consideration of the circumstances. Knowing that something should be done, they act even if they gain no advantage. Knowing that something should not be done, they refrain even if by acting, they would gain an advantage. When action is called for, they act immediately, without hesitation or delay. The fourth kind is proper action, performed with pure mindfulness and wisdom. The Buddha's guidelines for heedful action are twofold, concerning both internal and external activities. The former are the exhortations to spiritual development, to make effort towards higher states of consciousness, which is equal to attaining the spiritual benefit from the three characteristics or the liberation of the heart. In brief, this activity is personal improvement. The latter are the teachings for daily life and interaction with the world. The urging of diligence in work, the fulfillment of responsibilities, the solution and prevention of problems, the development of virtue and the fostering of social well-being. In brief, this social improvement. The teachings of heedfulness encourage contemplation on three periods of time, the past in order to draw lessons from past events and experiences and to use these lessons as incentives for further effort, the present for greater urgency in one's activities, for not postponing and for making the most of each moment, and the future to reflect on potential change, both beneficial and destructive, by using wisdom to examine causality, followed by plans to prevent harm and advance the good. Compared with the Buddha's spiritual teachings, the practical teachings are fewer and of less detail. 
They are found scattered throughout the scriptures and tend to be concise. The reason for this is that human activities vary greatly according to time and place. They cannot be described with any uniformity. Therefore, the Buddha merely presented principles or examples. In contrast, the transformation of the heart pertains to all human beings. The nature of the human mind is identical for all. Furthermore, the transformation is profound and difficult to realize, and is the unique aspect of the Buddha's teaching. He thus explained it thoroughly.